Let's do this. The Cult of Hockey podcast by the faithful and for the faithful. I'm David Staples of the Edmonton Journal, and I'm here today with Bruce McCurdy. Hey, Bruce. Hey, David. How are you doing tonight? Uh, really good. Really good. That was a heck of a game between the Edmonton Oilers and the Los Angeles Kings. First, it had that kind of playoff intensity. We haven't seen a game that intense in a while. And the Kings are a formidable foe led by a couple wily, wily, wily veterans in Drew Doughty and Adzi Kopitar. Thank God they're down a few of the wily veterans like Dustin Brown and Jonathan Quick. Uh, but this is this is a really good hockey team. And uh, it looked like they were going to walk away with this game in the first period. They got up two to nothing. And the Oilers uh, came back and tied it in the second with two goals, and they won it in the shootout with Derek Ryan. Great big goal. What do you think of the shootout, Bruce? Well, I'm not a huge fan anymore. I, I, I honestly like it better if it was uh, if they got the points right. If it was two and one and three and zero, you know, I, I would find it more legit than this business of giving a third point in a game when other games are only worth two. Um, uh, it's lost its luster long since, but uh, tonight's was pretty exciting. LA scored twice to go ahead, and both times Edmonton responded with a terrific goal. And, uh, then Skinner stopped a couple, and uh, uh, Talbot stopped one on dry saddle, but then Ryan hit the spot dry saddle was trying to hit over the pad, under the glove, right inside the post. And that was that, and that was enough for your 37-year-old Derek Ryan to be named first star, according to the experts at, what do they call this barn now, uh, Crypto.com Arena. And I would have said the guy that scored the goal and the assist and the shootout goal, Connor McDavid, maybe was the choice, but we can talk about that in a minute. Uh, when Leon went in, I just thought, I said, he's not going to score and he didn't, but when Ryan went in, I said, he's going to score. And I just, he's just such a smart guy. I just thought he's going to figure out a way to score on this goalie. It was and a great choice. Inspired choice. It, it, it was like, I was thinking, who are they going to go with next? I thought maybe Hyman, mm -hmm. but Hyman's kind of a one trick pony go to his backhand or, you know, he, he, he wouldn't be a great pick. Um, Bouchard maybe. But he's, I don't know, he doesn't really have a deke move. And he's he has got a good shot, but so maybe mm -hmm. Bouchard. But it's kind of like dry settle as someone with a great, mm -hmm. you know, set piece shot. You know, you, you want someone to take the corner kick, it's Evan Bouchard or Leon dry settle. But, um, you know. It would have been Kane if he was playing, probably. Yeah, it would have been. But you're was. right. And Kane would have been a good pick because Kane can really fire the puck. And he's a goal scorer. So, yeah, uh, Evan, Evan Evander Kane was a um, late scratch for the game because of a groin injury, apparently. Uh, Mark Spector reported and uh, Lavoie, Raphael Lavoie, got another chance. And I thought it was, in some ways, the most interesting game from Lavoie. Like, he was yes. involved in a lot of stuff. It was the most high event yes. game, and there was good and bad uh, mm -hmm. in that game. Bruce, this is our... Two good things, two numbers, two, two two good things, two bad things, and two numbers podcast with one conundrum. What's your good thing? I'm going to go with that guy I mentioned him a couple minutes ago, number 97, Connor McDavid, who played a 600th career NHL game tonight, and he played it in style, uh, basically bringing Oilers back from uh, two goal deficit by scoring a beautiful power play goal himself. Uh, when almost from the goal line, he chipped the puck. He didn't shoot it that hard, but he chipped it at this little tiny space by Cam Talbot's ear. And somewhere between the name bar and, and, and side of his mask, it hit something and bounced into the the net. And he's he's pretty good at those. He doesn't make them all, but he makes a fair number of them. And he does it quite a bit where he comes in the super low angle and just goes for that little postage stamp over the goalie's short side shoulder. And then he made, I thought, a brilliant play on the tying goal 
the two two uh, uh, with one of those exquisite spins that he does. It's this after there was a four on four this time, and they put uh, uh, Leon Drysaddle and uh, McDavid out for the four on four, and they clicked right off a face off, and uh, Drysaddle intercept, intercepted the puck, got it to McDavid. He did one of those spin moves and. Uh, Leon went for the front of the net, and Connor fed it, and Leon smashed it into the corner. And no goalie in the league, I don't think, would have stopped that one. And uh, so that uh, tied the game. But I, I thought Connor played a pretty indomitable game, and he was all over it. Like, he played 25 minutes and 52 seconds in this game, uh, five shots, 12 shot attempts, uh, he was always best in the face-off circle, and I I just thought he was going hard. And the Kings weren't given much, you know. They're a really strong defensive team, and he had to work hard to break through uh, a few times, and a lot of times he couldn't break through. But uh, uh, his and and certainly in the uh, in the second and third periods, when frankly Edmonton was the better team in both periods. Uh, and he was the guy leading the way, and uh, that's a heck of a way to uh, hit a milestone game, beat a fierce rival, and a comeback win on the road. Indeed. The Kings, uh, Bruce, they had 13 grade-A shots. The Oilers had 11. Connor mm-hmm. McDavid made major contributions to eight of Edmonton's 11 grade-A shots. Oh, so the, wow. they had, Edmonton had very little going on. Um outside of McDavid's uh, heroic play. I mean, he came out, he was he was slow in the first period, but man, in the second period, did he ever ramp it up? Yeah, he's, his cutbacks, uh, they are amazing. Yeah, they are yeah. amazing. I often uh, call in my wife from, the, she's you're often doing something in the kitchen, I call her to see, because we both are working on our skating all the time. And his cutbacks, <laughs> It's just mind blowing. It's mind blowing <laughs> what he does on those cutbacks to his backhand, mm-hmm. um, especially. And uh, yeah, the, even in the NHL, like there's no one else in the NHL, I don't think, who does that. Kale McCarr is an interesting mm-hmm. skater in his own way, might be in some ways a more agile skater in some ways than McDavid. They're de- kind of different skaters. He's the only other NHLer who's skating in any way, I think, compares to McDavid. But not in the cutback category, McDavid's just all on his own there, and uh, he's like the <laughs> Franz Clammer, cutting so mm-hmm. hard on those on those blades. Uh, Bruce, my good thing, and and I would argue the first star was Stuart Skinner. Mm-hmm. Um, the Oilers, he stole this game. Um, I mentioned the Kings had thirteen to grade A shots to eleven for the Oilers when it came to the most dangerous of all shots that was eight for the kings the five alarm shots that was eight for the kings and just five for the oilers and right from the start of the game skinner was playing well he made a number of key saves early on to give Edmund a chance you know the first one is a minute into the game and a backhand shot from kopitar and he and he slams the door next there's this kind of a sprawling glove save on pierre luc dubois uh, wide open net, and Skinner got a glove on it. He, he, there was little chance on Fiala's shot, uh, but a moment after that, he made a great save off uh, on Lewis uh, in the slot. Mm-hmm. Um, Kempe's goal um, was a, the, the guy is an incredible attacker, Kempe, uh, with a wicked shot. And it would have, a save would have been nice. But not necessarily expected because that was such a wicked shot and he's such a sniper. So um, so he he got beat there. That was the only arguable mistake that he made in the game. Really, he he made some he made a great. Uh, there was a slap pass that Kopitar directed at net. Um, there was a great there, you know a scramble play. There was Blake Lazat firing at net and he kind of went over sideways and sprawled and stop it and then in the third period there was a great one-timer from drew dowdy where uh rafael lavoie got caught wandering around uh in his own zone not not cover in the red light zone as we call it not covering mm-hmm. anyone not covering a passing lane he might have been expected to cover dowdy or and uh Doughty got off a wicked one-timer and 
Skinner was there. Then in overtime, he was also tested a couple times. Um, well, actually, just Nuge made the one stop in overtime, which was a fabulous play. Mm. But there was one shot that I think actually was going in. It went off Nurse's skate, and he managed to get his mm. pad on it. So Stuart Skinner was – what a great game from Stuart Skinner, and what a great – what a, what a relief it is for me to be saying that now and then uh, after the start of the year. But in, since, since, the start, since the start of December, he's been really hot. So. 9.29 tonight. So Good stuff. He's, uh, he's been on a roll for sure. And uh, I, I wonder what his safe percentage is for December now. I think Jonathan Willis did, had it at uh, maybe 9.13. Heading into the game, I can't remember. Sounds about right. Yeah, but it's going to be going up a little bit after that. So good for Stuart Skinner. Huge. Yeah, he's had uh, lots of doubters out there, you know, and uh, and yeah. you know, with cause, given how brutal it was at the start of the year, it was eight fifty four at one point around game ten mark when Campbell got sent down. Skinner actually had a worse save percentage than Campbell at that point. But since then, he steadily worked his way back up, and it's still it's a long way just to get to 900, you know. But uh, he's starting to put up, you know, a, a steady strings of games over 900, and that save percentage keeps improving. And of course, the main <coughs> thing that you're looking for is the W, and uh, he's been collecting plenty of those. I think now 13 and four in his last 17. So, and, and Bruce. This is the first time all year the orders have been above real 500. Huge mm -hmm. game in that regard because because yeah. they could have backslid. And we mentioned this last podcast. They finally right. have worked their way back up to real 500 again. Mm -hmm. They had uh, third. What did they have heading into this game? Um, uh, 16 wins and 16 losses. Right. And um, now they got 17 wins and 16 losses. So it's just they're really. Yeah. They're really getting it going on. And it wasn't, in some ways, the comeback isn't surprising, is it? Because this is a team that's just been dominating at even strength. They've got it in them to, to play solid hockey. And I, and I think they're getting the confidence to know that. And, uh, of course, McDavid is McDavid, and he willed them back into this game. What's your match? surprising, David, if you watch the first period. Yeah, and if, after that you're thinking, well, two nothing, four nothing, six nothing. That's about the way this one's going to go because it wasn't, <laughs> yeah. it wasn't good. Yeah, and they didn't give up a sniff the rest of the way. And this isn't officially a good thing, but I love the way the Oilers managed this game. And the third period, especially with the two-two tie, they stayed patient. They gave up nothing, and they created a few chances. Leon damn near won it in the dying seconds, but they had a few other. Pretty good looks around the net. Hamblin had one, you know. McDavid certainly had one. And I thought that, you know, if anyone was going to win in regulation, it would have been Edmonton. And in the end, they they did get yeah. the uh, the points. So in the, in the third period, Bruce, it was for Grade A shots. It was five to one five for one. the Oilers. Mm -hmm. they, you know, they really uh, came on strong. Uh, Bruce, what's your bad thing? Yeah, uh, a few things, but I'm just going to single out one. This one was just so egregious. Uh, the interference penalty that was called on Raphael Lavoie when he was just skating through the neutral zone and and uh, Adrian Kempe came out on a line change and just skated right out off the bench out of nowhere. And, and, uh, and Lavoie got a piece of him. Uh, on the way by, and he, uh, he, like he didn't, like he didn't even like bring his arms up to defend himself. Nothing. He just kind of brushed him on the way by, and it was kind of like you know, it's like if you're driving down the highway and all of a sudden a deer runs out of nowhere into your car, right? I mean, there's only so much you can do. <laughs> Jesus. And the ref decided to call that a penalty, and. Uh, Man, and this was like the fourth penalty against Edmonton and only one against L.A. Well, after that, I think even the refs kind of saw the light that this, one, this game had not been particularly straight and uh, and it wound up 4-4 four, four on power play. So, you know, no overall complaints, but that call was so brutal. 
that. I have to single it out as as, uh, as my bad thing. And poor Raffle of Law sitting in the penalty box. <laughs> what did I do? And Chris Knobloch, I mean, he's a pretty cool customer on the bench. This is the first time I've seen him on the bench where I thought he was visibly upset. That's what I and wrote he in didn't, the uh, game. He didn't breaks. yell. He didn't, you know, but you could see he was just kind of shaken. And, and 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 shaking with rage, and he really wanted an explanation from the refs as to what his player did wrong to deserve a penalty there. And luckily, they didn't even have to kill the whole thing. Uh, uh, the refs started making it right on the. I think Hyman drew one while they were. Well, it couldn't have been Hyman while they were killing. Who the heck was it anyway? They they drew one on the PK, and. Uh, that wound up setting the four on four of that uh, scored the tying goal. But just that one call, my goodness. It was the first time, I agree with you, that I've seen Coach <laughs> K get upset. And I did write that in my uh, game grades. Uh-huh. Yeah, same thought occurred to me. Uh, Bruce, my bad thing was the start of the game. In particular, three players um, who you're, who the Oilers are counting on to lead this team in tough games and all three of them made were rather ineffective in the first period didn't have their uh, a game going and all three of them made major mistakes on grade a shots they just the kind that have killed the oilers in the past in the playoffs in big games so uh a minute into the game leon um just let kopitar walk right in uh and get was it a pass that he got or a rebound i can't recall but i think I think it was a rebound yeah, anyway, yeah, Leon was just let him go. And Kopitar got a wicked backhand shot. It could have easily been one nothing a minute into the game. Um, shortly after that, uh, well, it's not shortly, but 15, 15 minutes after that, it was McDavid um, who just let uh, Troy, is it Trevor Lewis? Trevor Lewis. Mm-hmm. Open in the slot, left him wide open, you know, didn't cover his man. Both guys were puck watching, which is what good players do. It's their, it's the reason they make mistakes on defense as much as anything. It's because they're just so focused on the puck. And um, it goes uh, through Bouchard, through McDavid, and Lewis is wide open and gets a really great chance to score. The, and there was a rebound on that that was also close to going in. He put it off the side of the net. And then uh, Darnell Nurse, the third big leader on this team, the only other one is Nugent Hopkins, who has a, a letter on his sweater. And he, Nugent was okay in the first. But at Nurse, it was that old problem again, um, letting a, making a bad play at the offensive blue line. He did get a little bit of bad luck there in that his skate got caught up with Kempe. At mm-hmm. the same time, he was on the wrong side of Kempe for that play. And um, it's a two-on-one, and Kempe... Is not a guy you want to let in on a two-on-one. He's just such, he's their best attacking player. He is such a, I wish he was an oiler. He is such a great hockey player, that guy. He is a force. And Darnell let him by. He gets pass off the boards, pass up the boards, and he's off to the races to score a goal. So I didn't like the score. We saw why on that one. Yeah. I didn't like the leaders not leading uh, defensively. Mm Mm-hmm. Because that's what's if they want to win the Stanley Cup, they've got to, they've got to, not make that those kinds of errors. Well, I'll suggest all three of those guys bounced back and hard in the second and third periods and and played well, not just average I, but well. And uh, Nurse, I st- I never did see a replay on that first goal that properly explained to me why he stumbled and went down on that play. Whether they locked skates or. I don't yeah. think it was like he got the skate kicked out from under him, but he stumbled and fell, and Kempe was off to the races. And on that play, that was all it took. So, Nurse was backing up, and it looked like he was just starting to pivot, maybe. And his skate caught Kempe's skate, and Kempe was going by him, was by him already. And uh, I think that's what happened, as I saw it. But he was on the wrong side of Kempe on that play. Even if he hadn't stumbled, he might not have caught him. Um, or uh, been able to deny that great shot by Kempe. Although Nurse is a pretty fast skater. Um, Bruce, what is your number? Uh, two, two, one is my number. You go ahead, David. 
You were going to market uh, no, you, or something. Well, I got. Oh. I'm gonna. I'm gonna segue from my. Oh, oh, the that's where the segue is. Sorry, my bad. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, my my numbers uh, uh, tonight is a lot to do with ice time. Um, McDavid twenty five fifty two. He played in this game. Bouchard twenty nine oh one. Let's start there. Actually, uh, McDavid twenty six minutes. I'll just round it to the nearest minute. McDavid twenty six. Nugent Hopkins twenty four. Drysaddle twenty four. Hyman twenty four. Bouchard twenty nine. And I mean, some of that was on the power play. Like those guys all played five minutes on the power play. Yeah. Uh, uh, but still, they were also among the leaders in even strength ice time. I mean, Bouchard played almost 24 minutes at uh, even strength. And so that's huge reliance on the top guys. At the bottom end of the spectrum, we had the fourth line playing uh, about six or seven minutes each for uh, Hamblin, Lavoie, and uh, uh, Ernie. And surprisingly to me, uh, Brett Kulak, played just nine minutes and 53 seconds in this game, which is way low. And That's, uh, that's weird, eh? Because he, yeah. he played well. Because, yeah, DeHarnay played 13 and and Kulak played nine, and they really heavily leaned on the top four. Well, that's PK. So, and it's, right. yeah, certainly it's PK. DeHarnay got an extra couple minutes on the PK. And uh, that uh, Kulak doesn't play either special team, so sometimes he comes out. At, you know, number six, but it's strange to see him under 10 minutes. And the concern here for me is that they have another game tomorrow at 6 p.m. They have the minimum allowable by uh, the CBA, 22 hours between face-off, between 8 p.m. tonight and 6 p.m. tomorrow. And they're playing a much more, uh, a much weaker opponent in Anaheim Ducks. And hopefully they will uh, have what it takes to suck it up and get a win. But that's probably going to be an ugly game tomorrow. And one of the reasons is going to be that the uh, top players at Edmonton uh, uh, are going to have an energy deficit. And they also, you know, just took a bit of a pounding tonight. This was a pretty physical grinding affair. And, uh, you know, I think that, you know, not getting crushed like last game where, where they really got smoked a couple of times, but just more the just the 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 energy budget was high, high, high. And these guys kept bringing it. So uh, the numbers are just, you know, what they are. It's not neither positive nor negative. It's just the fact that they have to deal with tomorrow. Uh, I think Bouchard might have had, and McDavid, they both had two shifts in overtime too. So that's yep. that was probably two minutes um, added on for both of them there. Oh, easily, yeah. 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 Maybe more than that. So, and some of it was power play time, which is less arduous on the body, obviously, than grinding mm-hmm. it out against Drew Doughty, the ferocious Drew Doughty. He is well, a he is a great hockey player, Drew Doughty, and I hate him. <laughs> and Mikey Anderson and Matt oh, Roy. Yeah, I mean, these are yeah. tough guys. Like you they know, really you are. You, you know, you gotta you gotta outwork them, or at least match their work and outskill them but you're not going to uh you're you're not going to fancy dan your way out there with these guys you got to get your shoulders into it and your back into it and work and that's where like say mcdavid dry saddle i thought nurse uh, uh really picked it up and uh in the back part of the game the best thing about mikey anderson is when he gets drilled into the boards um, that one line they have is um, awesome. Kempe, Kopitar, and Quinton Byfield. That's a scary, scary yeah, they're line. They're all huge, right? Yeah, they're all huge. Thank goodness Anze Kopitar is no longer in his playing prime, but uh-huh. he's still a good hockey player. Yep. And Byfield's coming on, and Kempe is at his absolute peak, and is just a, you know, he's a force out there. Bruce, my number is 18. That is the number of grade A shots that Connor Brown has had so far this year. Hmm. So normally, and we're going to get into what some people hate to hear, hear ever discussed. They can't even have a discussion about it. It drives them so crazy. But 
when you have 18 grade A shots, Bruce, you have an expected goals of 4.5 goals. You'd expect you'd expect him to have about four goals, maybe five goals now. And he's got none. He had a great shot tonight. That line had a really good shift where he got two good shots. One in in the high slot. And then uh, I think it was Ryan. Yanmark won the puck at the blue line. Went to Ryan down low. Ryan set up uh, Brown who got off a quick shot and couldn't score. So (laughs) the conundrum is when (laughs) when is this guy going to, poor guy, when is he going to score? That's the conundrum. Soon. I agree. He's playing well, actually. He's playing better. He's starting to play better again. Yeah. Now, yeah, I mean, he's gotten raked over the coals pretty good. I mean, that contract is is pretty sus, as the kids would say, and uh, uh, the way it comes in next year. And, of course, I thought in the first part of the year, he was sort of feeling his way back from the knee injury, and I thought he was starting to play well. And then he got hurt in game nine, and he missed six games. Uh, but since he's come back, I don't think he's played as well as he was playing before he got hurt. And I think he's probably carrying something and playing through it, but starting to look a little, a little better. And, and, uh, the instincts are, I mean, you, you can see he's an accomplished offensive player. Like he's not just a slug that's never scored and is never going to score. He actually used to be able to score, and I, I anticipate he will again. But clock's ticking, man. I mean, stick one in that tomorrow night would be a great time to do that. Tomorrow they're going to need all hands on deck from four lines, and it'd be a great time to get contributions from guys like him, Jan Mark. You know, maybe Ernie. You know, the guys a little further down are probably going to be playing double digit minutes tomorrow night. And, and they can make the job of the whole team a lot easier by winning those minutes, not just sawing them off, but actually winning them. But you need to maybe, put the uh, in the net to do that. Yeah, maybe Ryan McLeod will have a good game again as opposed to disappearing like he did tonight. Um, he has been playing well, though. Bruce, there's nine <laughs> players who under who who have who have done way better under Coach K than they did under uh, Woodcroft. Mm-hmm. Though and those so those nine players in or and this is in magnitude of how much better they've done. Um, the the Eckholm and McDavid have just been light years better um, under Coach K than they were under Woodcroft. Oh, Evan Bouchard's been quite a bit better. Connor Brown's been better. Kane's been better. Hyman's been better. McLeod's been better. R R N H has and Vinny DeHarnay. Now, not coincidentally. Five of those players started out the year either coming back from an inju- injury or injured. Eckholm, McDavid, uh, both Eckholm injured in preseason, McDavid injured as the year goes along. Connor Brown coming back from injury, Evander Kane coming back from two injuries still, I would suggest, and also mm-hmm. injured through the off and on through this uh, season, and Ryan McLeod coming uh, back from a preseason injury. So Injury was a huge factor in the Oilers' week start. But man, have these players ever amped it up. And it's interesting how much the defensemen have amped it up uh, with Paul Coffey as uh, the coach. It's just astonishing how well this defense group is playing, Bruce. There's the, the Oilers' defense corps has never come close to playing this well. Um, it, you know, we, did, we weren't measuring grade A shots and five alarm shots in the... 2006 Stanley Cup run. But that was a pretty good defense unit. This defense unit is by far, and no defense unit has been close to the level of play that we're seeing from this group of players under uh, Coach K and Paul Coffey. And I give, I, I do give Coffey a lot of credit. I've been listening to what he said in a couple of interviews. Yeah, he's, he's, he's all about taking your time, you know, Making Make the play, plays. making plays, not taking your time, but making plays, moving your feet and making mm-hmm. plays as yeah. opposed to the old Chris Russell put her off the boards and out. It would be interesting to see Chris Russell if Chris Russell had played <laughs> for Paul Coffey, if he would have got because Chris Russell could. Chris Russell was like a 90 point defenseman, I think, in, ju- in his last year of junior was. hockey. He, he was an incredible. I, I think he would have because he was such a fantastic skater and, and he would have had then permission to play a different 
style of game. I don't know if like some defensemen. Yeah, I think they'd all. I mean, Vinny DeHarnay's picked it up considerably, but um, yeah, the Oilers as a as a team obviously have, but these defensemen are leading the way. They are they are just uh, excelling tonight. Tonight was um, they were okay. The defense moving the puck, but LA just man, they just play a great checking game. They're a fantastic defensive hockey team, and. Um, it's great to be great to see the Oilers beat them. I, I hate the LA Kings Bruce. There are my, you know, there's, you, you might have your own list. You probably have a very similar list like Dallas, Los Angeles, um, Minnesota. I hate Minnesota just because, just because they always seem to beat the Oilers. Vegas. Uh, Vegas. Is, are they on your list? I don't even know if they're no, on they're, 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 they, they, they're crawled onto my list. Uh, uh, I at first as a as a new team, I I was just interested to see how they went about their business. But having now seen how they go about their business, I've become not a fan. Okay. And now that they won the cup and they you know beat the Orgs in the playoffs on the way to do it. I've got uh, you know I want to see those guys go down. Anaheim used to be on my list, but they're not really that much anymore. Ask me tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but LA and Dallas, those LA. two teams. Yeah, I hate them. They stole Gretzky from us, man. Yeah, I, I was about to curse them. <laughs> All right, Bruce. Um, we'll be back at this tomorrow. Thanks for yeah, we sure will talking tonight. All right, thanks for listening, everyone. And in the meantime. And in between times, this has been another edition of the Cult of Hockey podcast.